the aspect that everything is grace, everything is mercy, everything is forgiveness. And they don't want to talk about anything to do with repentance. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about iniquity. They don't want to talk about God's law to be perfect, in a sense. Uh, the last sermon, um, just to if any who wasn't here, uh, we distinguish between the moral law of God and, of course, the, the other aspects of the law. And so, predominantly, we are speaking about the moral law, just to be clear. Okay? And, and if you do recall last time, uh, out of all the scripture passages that I had quoted, I would hardly even did any of the Old Testament. I, I predominantly stayed within the New Testament about 90% of the passages. And that's, that's an affirmation to prove to us that it's still there. You can go in Galatians 5, you can go in, um, I'm sorry, Galatians 6, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, and these are areas that continue to reinforce the moral law of God, even in the beginning of Romans. And I wanted to further delve into this subject, and I think I, this may be the last one. Part two might be it for me, but I, it has truly troubled my soul to, to think that it has no application. And, and I personally, I've also kind of struggled with the aspect of the law as well. If you didn't know, and believe it or not, you know, give certain names to different ideas and doctrines and such. Well, we all know what legalism is, you know, your self-righteousness, self-justification, how righteous you are. You use the law as if you are abiding by every facet of it, which nobody is. And then the, the opposite, which I just learned about this, by the way, it's called antinomianism, which anti meaning against. And nomianism means the law. So it seems like there's these two extremes. And I actually, for much of my Christian walk, I was an antinomian. I really was. I didn't want to hear about the law. I didn't want to hear about my sin. All I wanted to hear about is that hey, you got grace. That hey, you got mercy. You got forgiveness. I didn't want to hear about my sin. I didn't want to hear about my struggle with sin. But the reality is, is that's there. It's our sin that separates us from God. So he will not hear our, our prayers. It's basically called the two pillars in a sense of God's word. When you go back and forth from New Testament and Old Testament, you're going to see the law and you're going to see the gospel. You're going to see the gospel in the Old Testament and you're going to see the law in the New Testament. They're both there. Now, I want to be full disclosure about this uh, sermon. Um, I, do, you know, I do research and I read commentary and I read the uh, this the sermons and so forth and so on. And I have to give uh, credit to uh, the two pastors that I got a lot of this material from. Uh, pastors Fred Fritz and Jim Mueller. And uh, a lot of it has been uh, altered, a lot of it has been modified and edited, but I have to give them the credit that they deserve because it was beautiful what I read from them. It was so concise that I said I could never put it down on paper the way they did it. I could never do that. So I um, I want to give them the credit that's due to them. So we're going to be predominantly in Romans. So if you have your Bible, we're not going to be moving much at all. We're going to be in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to be starting in verse 7. So remember that Paul's letter to the Romans is an amazing treatment of God's plan of salvation. And one prominent aspect in Romans is Paul's treatment of the law of God and its role in our coming to faith in Christ. And then, of course, living for Christ. We start with verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. 
For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but then when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. The Romans letter, you could maybe say, is Paul's masterpiece exposition on salvation. He teaches us in a lot of theological language on that, how God saves us. He tells us how God saves us from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. Thus, the letter to the Romans is the good news of God. In Romans 7, 1 through 6, previous to what we just read, Paul indicated that Christians have been released from the law, having died to that which formerly bound us. This does not mean that Christians are free from obligations to the law. In fact, Paul stresses that Christians now, verse 6, serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. But at this point, someone may raise an objection. Paul, you have said that Christians have died so to sin in the death of Christ. And you have followed that by saying that we have also died to the law. Are you not putting sin and the law in the same category? Are you not implying, if not actually saying, that the law is sinful? The objection raised is stated in the first part of verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? Basically answering, providing the question. In other words, was the law given by God through Moses actually evil? And can Christians now disregard the law and live as they please? Paul responds with an emphatic negative. By no means. Your other translations will say, absolutely not. Or, God forbid. That Greek phrase is an emphatic and absolute denial that is incontroversial. Every time you see that phrase, it is a no, a resounding no. Look at Romans 6.15. This is where he's constantly asking questions. He's answering them. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Absolutely not. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Again, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Absolutely not. How can we? who died to sin, still live in it. And then lastly, Romans 3.31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. Absolutely not. God forbid. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The emphasis is extremely clear. The law not only is not sinful, but in fact continues to have great value for us Christians. The law of God is not sinful. It is good. The grace and faith that we have doesn't give us a license to sin or to overthrow the law. Let's notice four, four good things that the law does. The first good thing that the law does is that it reveals sin. Paul says in Romans 7, 7, the second part of it, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. God has revealed his righteous standards to us through the law. We would not have known what sin was if we did not have God's law. But God has given us the law, and therefore we know what sin is. Paul has already alluded to this in Romans 3.20, where he said that through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now Paul is not speaking about humanity's general awareness of right and wrong. Even non-Christians or pagans or unbelievers who have never heard of God's revealed law, never rush, according to Romans 2.15, show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. 
problem conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. In this verse, Paul is speaking about the law showing us the full extent of our personal sin. Throughout the rest of the chapter, Paul uses the first person singular pronouns, I and me, indicating that he's giving his personal testimony, as well as teaching universal truth. He's relating the conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit worked in his own heart through the law before and during his Damascus Road encounter with Christ. Paul, as you recall, had been trained in Judaism since his early youth, has said that the famous uh, teacher, Gamaliel, in Jerusalem, had tried to follow the law meticulously and had considered himself to be zealous for God. Before his conversion, he easily could have prayed the prayer of that self-satisfied Pharisee in the temple who thanked God that he was not like other people. He may have asserted with the rich young ruler that he had kept all the laws since his youth. But during this pre-salvation experience of conviction, Paul, however, came to realize that the most important demands of God's revealed law were not external, but they're internal, and that he failed to meet them. It is significant that the apostle chose the most obviously internal injunction of the Ten Commandments to illustrate his personal experience of the law revealed sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. It may have been the growing awareness of his own covetousness that finally broke his pride in knowing his heart to his own sin and the transforming work of the Spirit. The real battle with sin is internal in the heart and the mind. Only the transforming power of the Holy Spirit can take a sinful heart and make it pure and acceptable to God. The law's part of that transformation is to make us aware of our sin and our need for divine forgiveness and redemption. There's a missionary by the name of John G. Patton from 1858 to 1897. He was a missionary to the island of Vanuatu. I didn't know what this was either, but it's basically to the east of Australia and to the west of Fiji and to the north of New Zealand. And when he went to Vanuatu, he encountered what you could call Stone Age culture of people. And they were committed to savagery, superstition, and cannibalism. And shortly after they arrived on the island, his wife had given birth to their first baby boy, but then tragically died of the fever 19 days later. And to make things even worse, his newborn son had passed away a couple of weeks after his wife. He literally had to sleep on the graves of his dead wife and child for several days so that the islanders would not dig up their bodies to eat them. This is the environment he was in. He labored, obviously, in this amazing difficulty and trials. But eventually, the candles came to faith in Christ. What changed these candles into Christians? John G. Patton preached the law and he preached the gospel. And which law did he preach to them? Shall not murder. The law of God made them aware of their sin and sin and of their need for divine forgiveness and redemption. And then the Holy Spirit, having his way, changed the hearts and gave them faith and new life to the point where some of them even became missionaries to other islands. That's the first purpose of the law. It's to reveal our sin. The second good thing that the law does is that it arouses our sin. The law gives sin the opportunity to be aroused, working every kind of evil. Note the exact words of Paul in verse 8 
but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, producing all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies down. That is, sin uses the commandment. Sin is not in the commandment. It is separate from it. The commandment or law, it's not sinful. Sin is within us. It's not in the law. Once the law of God comes into our lives, it arouses sin, it activates sin, it creates a surge of rebellion in our hearts. The rebellion has been there all along. That's what it means to be a sinner. Sin means to be a rebel against God. But when the law comes into our lives, this dormant of rebellion is aroused from its slumber, as it were, and we discover it in our own hearts. St. Augustine, who is a 4th century bishop uh, of Hippo, it's a modern day Algeria, which is North Africa. He wrote this in his autobiography called Confessions. It was written around 400. A.D. He says, There was a pear tree near our vineyard, laden with fruit. One stormy night, we rascally youths set out to rob it and carry our spoils away. We took off a huge load of pears, not to feast upon ourselves, but to throw them to the pigs. Though we ate just enough to have the pleasure of forbidden fruit, they were nice pears, but it was not the pears that my wretched soul coveted. For I had plenty better at home. I picked them simply in order to become a thief. The only feast I got was a feast of equity, and that I enjoyed it to the full. What was it that I loved in that theft? Was it the pleasure of acting against the law, in order that I, a prisoner under rules, might have made counterfeit of freedom by doing what was forbidden, with a dim similitude of omnipotence? The desire to steal was awakened simply by the prohibition of stealing. So the desire to steal, to sin, was aroused by the law, as in Augustine's case. This is what the law does. And not only reveals sin to us, it also arouses sin within us. God gives us his commands and we rebel against them by doing the very opposite of what he commands, which we all are. The third good thing that the law does is that it ruins. It ruins the sin. The law brings us to the end of ourselves. Notice how Paul expresses in verses 9 through 11, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Look in Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active, right? Sharp and made double edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We have to keep it in the mind over and over again. But the New Testament, when this is written, the New Testament is still being written. So many of the times, we are still referring to the Old Testament. We are referring to the law of the prophets. John 16, 8. And when he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So it is the word of God in concert with the Holy Spirit that is piercing and convicting the hearts of mankind. Not me, not you. It's the word of God through us. It's the Holy Spirit through the Word. So when we hear or read something in the Bible that points directly at us and to our sin, whether it's hidden or whether it's obvious, we either have godly sorrow that leads to repentance, or we become more stiff-necked and angry with God. A good example of speaking of the stiff-neckedness that we have when we hear that we have sinned. Just look at the death of John the Baptist. Mark 6, uh, verses 18 through 19, we'll see this part. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And 
and the lady was going to rage against him and allowed to put him to death. But she could not at that time. And of course, later on, she did get away. But all John the Baptist said, it's not lawful you. It's not lawful for you to do that. You're just speaking of what the moral law of God says for us when we cannot do it. But she hated him for it. Just like today, it's no different. We tell somebody, well, you shouldn't be cheating on your wife. It's against God's law. Don't be surprised if somebody hates you for saying that. The truth will remain the same regardless though. And in the case of John the Baptist, sometimes the results for saying to someone that they are trespassing against God, it's going to be anger and then eventually murder. And that happens. Just a little anecdote. There was a, a professor at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. He was preaching on Romans. And he's expounding on the law. He was preaching on how the law ruins the sinner by stripping away the veil to reveal our human depravity. After the service was done, a woman approached him, and she was holding up her hand with her index finger and her thumb about a half inch apart, and she said, Dr. Gerstner, you made me feel this big. And he replied, but madam, that's too big. That's much too big. Don't you realize that this much self-righteousness is going to take you to hell? He's right. The law is intended by God to ruin us in the sense of driving out all of our self-righteousness so that we might look to Jesus Christ alone for grace and salvation. And finally, the fourth good thing that the law does is that it reflects the magnitude of our sin. Paul says in verse 12, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law does exactly what God intends it to do, and that purpose is good. The fact that the law reveals sin, arouses sin, ruins the sinner, does not make the law wicked. When a person is justly arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced for murder, there's no fault in the law, or even with those responsible with upholding the law. The fault is with the one who broke the law. We all know this. It's obvious. But once again, anticipating a question that would naturally come to mind in light of what was said. In verse 13, Paul says, Did that which is good then bring death to me? And once again, Paul answers his own question with a resounding, by no means. Absolutely not. The law itself is good. It is the breaking of it that is evil. How much more is God's law good and how much more evil is the breaking of it? Simply put, it is sin that causes spiritual death. It's not the law that causes spiritual death. The law reveals and arouses in order that sin might be shown that it is actually sin. And it's exposed under the pure light of God's word. God has given his holy, righteous, and good law in order that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Therefore, the preaching of the law is necessary to the preaching of the gospel. Until we see our sin for what it is, we will not see our need for salvation. The law then reveals the magnitude of our sin, and that's a wonderful thing. As we read and we meditate in the Word, we recognize that there are two voices, it seems, like in the Bible. It's the voice of conviction, the law, and it's the voice of grace and the gospel. When we understand the law and the gospel and their proper distinctions, especially that they are they're complementary. They're not contradictory. The Bible begins to make more and more sense and more and more clear to us. One of the purposes of the law is to drive us to faith in Jesus Christ. 
who fulfilled the demands of the law on behalf of sinners who trust in their own righteousness, or sorry, who trust in his righteousness and not their own. The law of God reveals our sin and arouses our sin, it ruins us, and it reflects the magnitude of our sin. Our only hope is in the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. So we should be thankful to the Lord for His holy and righteous law and to surrender to His grace. In short, I read you reading, do, do not, be, be not. The law tells us what to do and how to do it. And the reward and the punishment. It tells us the success or failure that comes with it. When we read out of the Ten Commandments or other areas of the moral law, we become mindful of God's holiness and what it demands. That we love Him above everything. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. The law says to do. The gospel tells us it has been done. The law exposes our guilt. The gospel closes us in grace. That's why gospel literally means good news. The gospel tells us how God has acted toward us in Christ. Specifically that though we are great sinners, Christ died for our sins, Romans 5 8. But God shows his love for us. And that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The good news concerning Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, declaring the gospel speaks life and peace and joy to the heart of a sinner like me and you. When the law has done its work in painting the sinner red with guilt, it is then that they are ready for the gospel to come and declare the good news of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. That Jesus fulfilled the law, he bore its curse, he became our substitute, and rose from the dead that sinners might be declared righteous in God's sight. To the weary sinner wrapped with guilt, we must talk with them with the good news of the gospel. After they have been crushed by the demands of the law. That Christ's blood is sufficient, his grace is deep, and their so that salvation is sure in him. And though we fail to live as we should, we trust that God's mercy in Christ is enough. Is the law good? Yes. Can it save you? No. Is the gospel good? Absolutely. Does it save? To the others. Praise be God for what he has demanded of us in his law that he's provided for us in his gospel. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word shows us ourselves. It shows us and reveals to us our hearts, our intentions. And we are flawed, Lord. Lord, you remember that we are both us. Heavenly Father, help us to always, always, Lord, be quick to confess our sins to you. Lord, your word says that you resist the proud but give grace to the humble. Although some of us may not have our sins on the outside, on our sleeve, and our shoulder, it's internal. And we all struggle with something, Lord. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, you convict hearts through your word. It is not for me or any man going to convict them in this heart or another person. It is through you and your power, and your grace, and your will be done, not my own will be done. We just ask that we continue to draw us closer to you. Help us to be more loving and gracious as you have been to us. To forgive as you have forgiven us. and to walk
all those who have walked. To be holy as you are holy. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters.